Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our March Lunch and Learn session. We are so excited to have you all joining us today. We have with us the great and the wonderful Reverend Emily Chastain. We are so excited to have her sharing with us on today. Emily has been amazing working with our board. She's one of our board members. She's also someone that I have learned to love history through because as I told her the other day, I call her an Episcopal ecclesiastical historian. Oh my. <laughs> Literally breaks down the history of the church in a way that is just so much more tolerable and palpable for most of us. If you're not a historian by your own academic background, Background, you will come to love history listening to Emily Chastain. And so I am so glad to have her with us. I'm just going to share a few housekeeping pieces just so that we can get started with minimal interruption. And the first is that we'd like for you to understand that we'd like you to mute your devices unless you're speaking so that if there's any background noise around you, we don't have to be interrupted if someone's talking. And we also ask that you feel free to use the chat function that you see at the bottom of your screens. If you have questions or comments or feedback, you can also use the reactions key. I like to be able to uh, include a smiley face, a up or something to just say you agree with something that's said or thumbs down if you don't agree with it. We would love to hear you and see your comments. I wanna share with you quickly why we have these lunch and learn sessions. First of all, as you know, we did our first inaugural I and Her Women's Leadership Summit two years ago, well, almost two years ago. And we had over 700 people registered for that event and it was fantastic. I think the information was shared was just very, very powerful. And we didn't want it to end there. We wanted to maintain a connection with all of the persons who visited that particular workshop and keep the conversation of women supporting one another going. And so we wanna share information, we wanna offer support, we wanna provide resources for you and referrals for information that you might need. We also wanna promote teamwork and collaboration for United Methodist women and our supporters. And we wanna create a positive atmosphere and a positive culture that is so badly needed in our denomination today. Amen? <laughs> Y'all can say amen, just nod your head, okay? <laughs> and then we wanna just also- Amen. Wow. Yes, hi, Hortensia. Look, look, Hortensia, she's gonna speak. I <laughs> hello, hello, dear. Hello, how are you today, my dear? <laughs> Good, all the way from Mozambique. This Hortensia is a member of our board of directors as well as Reverend Emily. And we are so excited that she's able to be with us today. And hopefully we'll hear from you a little later on as the session proceeds, Hortensia. Yes. All right. Amen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. you. Good thank to see you. Thank you. Um, just to share a little bit about our agency, you know, the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women is headed up by our own Dawn Wiggins Hare. Dawn leads the agency um, and she is a former attorney and judge in the Alabama area. And she is one sharp cookie, I tell you. And we are so grateful to have her leading us in new and outstanding ways in different directions. And so this particular Lunch and Learn, these are some things that she's allowing us to do to be able to expand our footprint within the United Methodist Church. And so we are so grateful for her vision and her leadership. On today, we have with us the Reverend Emily Chastain. Emily, Emily is our guest presenter for today. And if you've been receiving our blog posts for since this beginning of this year uh, and following us on our social media, you've probably read some of her writings already. In fact, for the month of March, she's been doing a weekly blog for Women's History Month. Reverend Chastain studies history of the church, and she's particularly uh, studies Methodist history, which we think is really powerful because of the way in she's, which she's able to interpret that. And so she's a member of our board of directors, and she um, finds that meeting with us and other deacons sustains her ministry journey. And her work as a board member with us has helped her to reach back into what she's passionate about. Therefore, she is pursuing her doctoral work. She does credit 
her annual conference and G Cosrow work with pushing her to reach her goals for her doctoral study in unknown and unfamiliar places. I just want you to know that you are going to be hearing from a woman that you will remember her name in the years to come because she is going to make a profound, have a profound impact upon our denomination and on the church at, la at large. So I'd like to first ask you, because we're gonna be talking about women throughout history. Before I introduce Emily, if there is a woman in United Methodist woman who you can remember or know through history that has informed your life or has some type of positive influence on your life, name in the chat box so that we can see if we all know any of these folks and see who they are, who has had an impact on you as a United Methodist woman. And we'll go through that list throughout the time we're together today to see how uh, that's coming along and see if any of us have the same influencers. Um, and thank you, Emily, for putting that in there for me. Um, and so let me go ahead and turn it over to you, uh, Emily. Why don't you share with us a little bit about who you are, where you've been. Um, I don't want to give away too much because I think it's interesting for people to hear where you are geographically versus where you've been geographically. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed that uh, I told Pam this earlier this week. She has great hopes for me, and I hope that I can fulfill what she <laughs> hopes that uh, I can be one day. Um, it's really wonderful. This is part of the reason that I love the work of G. Cosro, is because it really is a lot of women lifting other women up, and it is an, a connection that is so necessary for me. Um, so you can probably hear it in my accent. I'm from the South, so I know we got a few Southerners representing on here today. Um, I grew up in rural Alabama, just outside of Birmingham, and I actually grew up in a different denomination. So I did not grow up Methodist, but I knew a lot of Methodists growing up. Um, and in that different denomination, I got a call to ministry at 21, uh, which baffled the male preacher. Um, he did not know what to do with me because women did not hold a pulpit uh, in the denomination in which I grew up. So um, I went to school, I, I got that call in college. I was a little slow on the uptake on uh, college education. I was a first gen university student, um, didn't really know what I wanted to do, didn't really know how to study. Um, so all of my peers graduated quite a few many years before I did, but I finally graduated from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So go Blazers if you've been watching the uh, NCAA tournament. Uh, they showed up in the first round and lost to who I believe is now going to be the national champion this year. Um, but uh, I took my first job in ministry at a Methodist congregation. And um, the, past, the the person who I was working with came up and was like, hey, we need you to teach confirmation. And I was like, what's confirmation? Because I didn't have confirmation when I was growing up. And through that process of learning that theology, all these light bulbs came off. And now I really found my home my theological home uh, in Wesleyan tradition. And so um, I worked for the North Alabama Conference for nine years um, prior to this, just following the um, the tornadoes in 2011 uh, that came through Alabama. That's how I kind of got introduced to conference work, but I had done a lot of volunteer things. Um, during that journey, lots of people kept asking me when I was going to become clergy and I kept telling them that they were crazy. I didn't need to jump through those hoops um, to do that work. Um, I was called and God would, would give me what I needed for the journey. Um, what I realized in that journey is that my vocational call was to help develop leaders within the church, clergy and lay. Uh, and that is where I had to struggle with that call to, to ordained ministry where it was like, okay, well, this, this really is uh, what that means. So I am now a deacon in full connection. I was ordained last summer in the North Alabama Conference. Um, I am a member of the North Alabama COSRO. Um, some of the things we did there, we did a salary study, uh, which was huge. We also, our, our bishop in North Alabama is a former president of G COSRO. So um, that work was important to, uh, to do in North Alabama. Um, and where I really fell in love with kind of what I'm doing now is um, 
we started going through and doing histories of um, like video interviews and talking about some of our previous barrier breaker awards, uh, award winners. And um, the North Alabama Cosro every year gives away a barrier breaker award named after Louise Branscombe. Um, who is one of the original uh, G. Cosro members uh, of the board, um, an amazing woman. She was a doctor. Um, she didn't let anybody keep her down. And her story and all these stories of all these other women that have been um, nominated for this award just really made me realize that we don't know any of these stories. And so um, I had always wanted to do doctoral work. I loved history. And so with all of this kind of feeding into um, what I wanted to do. I was like, okay, I need to go do my PhD. So I'm at Boston University, um, where it's currently less than 50 degrees outside. So as a Southerner, I'm not really used to the little long winter yet, but I do love the snow. Um, but I'm at Boston University focusing, uh, I'm in the School of Theology, and my degree focuses on, on the history of American religion with specific emphases on gender intersections and uh, also Methodist studies. So my hope is that I'll get to teach in a seminary uh, and help continue that vocational call to develop leaders uh, for the church, but also, you know, telling new stories. That was a really long answer to your question, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is okay. One of the things that I wanted you to talk about when you think about the women, and I know you're probably checking names in the chat that people are lifting up. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the blogs that you've written. And, you know, you started out just giving us that historical perspective. Um, bring us up to date for those who haven't done all the reading and just kind of give us a, a summary of the blogs and then the history of, of the women who've been very instrumental in the Equal Rights Amendment as well. I'm just bringing you full speed all the way up. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's go. That's a long uh, one. <laughs> I tell everybody sometimes with my students that um, it, it sometimes feels like you're drinking from a fire hydrant. So just hold on. <laughs> We're going to kind of push through. Um, I do want to say, like, you know, we focused on uh, when we started this year on the 50th anniversary of, of the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women and what a huge accomplishment that is, especially when in the last four or five general conferences, it always shows up as a potential to be on the cutting table. Um, and we always survive it and come out on the other side, maybe a little wounded, but uh, with our insights still focused on our mission. Um, and 1970, 1972 was a big year, not just for G. Cosro, um, not just in the United Methodist Church, not just even in the US, but you're really talking about some of these women's movements that are really pushing and having a lot of success of advancing equal pay for, for women. Um, of giving them opportunities that they've not been given before. But I always like to emphasize that that second wave of feminism never could have happened without the first wave, right? So there's a first wave of women that I think we we like to talk about them in, in suffrage and all that, but, um, you know, we want to talk about some of the things that they are really doing. So I kind of chose this one narrative that I'm going to go through and talk to you about, but I choose that narrative and I want to make sure to, that all of you hear that this is not, a, this is not an extensive narrative. This is not, um, this is very much an incomplete narrative um, that we cannot dismiss the incredible work of the women's division of Christian service, which later becomes United Methodist women that they are continually developing information for women, service opportunities for women, and helping them become advocates and, and activists for issues in their communities, in their churches, in their countries. Like they, they are really pushing women, um, not in a bad way, but like giving women the resources they need to really step out and really speak to a lot of these issues. So I'm choosing one little part of that narrative. Um, but I definitely want to give a shout out to the Women's Division, United Methodist Women, um, because in terms of women stepping outside of the church, um, they really have given a lot of uh, resources and effort to those things. Um, so when I think back to that first wave of women, 
Um, you might know uh, some people uh, that are in that first wave. Um, and I'm going to probably talk about a few of them that you may know today. Um, but I believe that things like even the suffrage movement uh, up to 1920 would not have happened without the church. Um, not just speaking about the United Methodist Church, speaking, of course, the United Methodist Church didn't exist then, but like it would not have existed, existed without a lot of the Protestant and Catholic churches that were in that time. And especially because of the social gospel movement, that social gospel movement where we really translate what scripture means and what it means to act that out becomes this huge catalyst for women to step outside of their domestic sphere. Um, the number one woman I always want to point to when we talk about social gospel, Frances Willard. What an amazing woman. Yes. Uh, also a Methodist. Um, her, she had this do everything policy. And she said, there's nothing a woman can't do that men can't do. Like women can do everything. She believes sometimes women did it better. Um, but she pioneered this leadership and this kind of organization for the church and for beyond. My favorite is her personal motto was agitate, educate, and organize. And she did Say all those things. She Say did that again. Well. Say that it again, you broke up. Agitate, agitate, educate, and organize. Okay, did everybody hear her? So, she a little bit on me. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. That's okay. I, you said agitate and then the rest was blank. Okay, so agitate. Uh-huh. Organize. Okay. Oh, you're putting it, I can see you typing into the chat. Yeah. <laughs> yes, agitate, educate, organize. Yes, yes, that's very good. So Frances Willard takes this motto, she kind of feeds it into the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is where most everybody knows her from. And this Women's Christian Temperance Union really becomes like a woman's church. This organization focused around women, the support of women, the advocacy of women. It has multiple levels. It has a local level, a national level, has an international level. And they have these speaking circuits that come out of this. And the speaking circuits become this way for women to be able to preach beyond the pulpit on social issues. So these women are becoming political activists. They're becoming lobbyists. The WCTU becomes this bedrock of social organizing. So you're looking at the way the social gospel develops this kind of organization is what feeds into the life of social work as we know it today. So social work would have, like their beginnings come from this social gospel movement, the WCTU, um, a lot of settlement houses and that type of work that women are doing as deaconesses and as lay women in the church. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this training ground for lots of future leaders. Um, they have an emphasis on the development of young women. Um, they know, I know I saw one name that popped up in the chat. One of the women that came through the WCTU that one person mentioned, Anna Howard Shaw. Uh, Anna Howard Shaw gets very involved in the suffrage movement following this. And of course, you know her, well, I know her as a Boston University graduate um, and uh, also ordained in the Methodist Protestant Church. So she becomes the first woman ordained in the Methodist Protestant Church. Um, because the Methodist Episcopal Church denied her ordination. Uh, another person that comes through this circuit is my favorite, and who's probably going to be the subject of my dissertation, uh, M. Madeline Southard. And she's from Kansas. She starts a whole host of other uh, women's organizations. Um, she wanted to be a preacher. She went and got a local license, but she wanted equity. She didn't want just the piece of paper saying that she could. She wanted the equal status to men. She was elected as a delegate uh, to the 1920 and the 1924 General Conferences. Um, and in both of those, she asks for the women's right to preach. She even hand wrote a letter to every single delegate with a copy of her article from the Methodist Review on Women in Ministry. She sends this to every General Conference delegate and says, hey, I'm gonna write this memorial, what we know now as a petition, to ask for women's equality, and I'm gonna ask you to join me. And she wrote a book too that came out of her thesis from school called The Attitude of Jesus Toward Women. 
in that book, she talks about how Jesus saw women as full persons, uh, despite the culture of the day to keep them as, as property. Uh, she believed they had mental equality with men and that because of their power and strength in relationships, that Jesus saw them as equals. Um, she uses the example of Mary Magdalene as the first gospel preacher in that book and argues that the biblical view of womanhood should not be that they are objects of relationships, but persons with relationships. So this is a theological shift that's really going to play into a lot of the development of feminist theology that comes into the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Now, she departs a little bit from Frances Willard. So Frances Willard kind of gives her this entree into this uh, world. Um, and then Frances Willard, she departs from, and um, Madeline Southard talks about how she is convinced that the celebration of domesticity is what keeps women from fully participating in God's kingdom and society. She advocated heavily for shared relationships. So this is a very different view from the Victorian view that women can have dominion over their homes and teach. And this is kind of the accepted view that women are contributing to society. But Southard is like, mm, nah, I'm not gonna fall for that because we should all be sharing the housework and women should be able to do all these things just as well as men. Mm -hmm. So she, she forms the American Association of Women Ministers, which later becomes the International Association of Women Preachers, as this way to advocate for women's ordination, both in the Methodist Episcopal Church, but in every other Protestant church. So she's really seeking to rattle all of Protestantism. That's pretty, pretty huge. That's big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's big. And she creates this newspaper called The Woman's Pulpit. And it circulates opinions, news. So if a woman has gotten a license to preach, it's printed in this newspaper. Um, but she really focuses on ways to help advocate for women's leadership in churches. Now, this denomination is kind of a precursor to things like um, United Methodist Women, um, to G. Cosro, to um, some of the denominational leadership opportunities that pop up for women. And when those start happening specifically in denominations so that they can focus on the specific polity, you start to see the IAWP lose a little bit of steam. They actually still exist today. Um, they are now the International Association of Women Ministers. Um, so they don't have as much emphasis now that it's gone a little bit more denominational. But she's also a peer of Georgia Harkness. Um, Georgia Harkness comes in a little bit later, but they both work on women's ordination. Um, unfortunately, Madeline Southard did not get to see the 1956 vote. But in 1924, she did see women given the option to preach and given licensure, although they were not given full connection, which is what makes 1956 very distinctive because they had been given licensing and local ordination, but not full ordination in the denomination. And of course, all that gets white. Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to tell you, did you notice um, someone in the chat indicated that there is an active IAWM chapter in Western Pennsylvania? Can you believe that? <laughs> so see, you're hearing Thank about you. the original founder of all of that. Yeah, very wow. cool. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what I find fascinating about all of this is that women have always been trailblazers, have always been very much... Uh, in tune with the need to step up and outside of the margins that were established for them by society. And I think your work really proves that. Your research shows that, you know, women have always been at the forefront of everything that's happened in society. And they organized even when they weren't supposed to be organizing, whether it be in back rooms, kitchens, grocery stores, wherever they could, in order to push forward the agenda for equity. And I think that's a very powerful uh, piece to bring out because we're still fighting for these same things today. In and out of the church. Yeah. I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I don't want to stop you, but I just wanted to just put that out there and just say, you know, when, when are we going to get past this and find a way where we're all treated equally? You know, um, and, and you see these disparities continuing to surface up in every little faction of our church and of the world and of society. And it's frustrating to know that in 1908, 1920, 1930, 1950, 1972, the same struggle, the same struggle. Mm -hmm. 
So I want to pause for a moment. Does anyone have any comment or question? Because I know you've got good stuff for us. I just want to make sure that anyone <laughs> has a burning comment or question that they're raising it before they lose it. Anyone, feel free. This is Irma. I just want oh, yes. to say yes uh, to Emily. Uh, you know, Isabel Fober and also Clara McSwain were women who did an awful lot. They opened the doors for lay women. Yes. And, and so you haven't mentioned anything about that. They were the first to do that. And of course, uh, Isabel Thoburn was a nurse and Dr. Clara Swain was a doctor. And those clinics, uh, one of the clinics still stands today in Lucknow, India. And we have a person within our Northern Illinois Conference who went to college there. And now she is, well, she's been here for years uh, and she is uh, an ordained elder here in the Northern Illinois Conference and still doing great work. And so uh, if you ever get a chance, look that up. It is just wonderful. And these are lay women, okay? So don't forget yes. us. Yes, and, and, and I should mention it's Dr. Irma Clark who uh, works from the medical field. And so this is very valuable for her because of her background and profession um, and also in support of lay women. And there are people like her who are working very hard throughout the church um, to ensure for equity as well. I appreciate your point. Very great, thank you. Yes, thank you, you said, very thank much. You, and Dr. I hope Irma, you- <laughs> In the chat. <laughs> I hope you get a chance to they want to know the names. Clark, yeah. To um to read the lay women's blog from last week. Because I definitely talked about like Mary McLeod Bethune and her em emphasis mm -hmm. on education. Um the week before that we talked about deaconesses, which are also a huge lay order, mm -hmm. um, and the international efforts that they did. So yes, we definitely could not do anything in this church without women lay women or clergy yes. so thank you for bringing them up yes okay mm -hmm. thank you dr irma you sound um, like you are in from umw now united women in faith oh, those yes. are that i that yes. i recognize from yes. that and i i would love for you to put that doctor in front of your on your thing here i was about to address you but it's important when we work hard for those things, especially mm -hmm. as a black woman, it's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, we've persevered and here we are. Yeah. Nice Amen. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Anyone else before Emily goes on? Okay, jump right back in. Take it away. <laughs> All right. So um, mentioned to you that women get the right to preach in 1924. They lose it again in 1939 with the merger of the Northern and Southern branches and the Methodist Protestant Church, um, which then requires them to bring back the decision in 1956. Between there, there's the formation of the Women's Caucus, which becomes a huge advocacy arm to bring in the work of um, the General Commission on Status and Role of Women. Of course, they're also active in United Methodist Women, which come in in 1968 now uh, United Women in Faith. Um, so these two central organizations, United Methodist Women and G. Cosro, um, are huge in the development of women's advocacy in the church. Um, you have the United Methodist Women who are focusing on education, they're focusing on public policy and how women get involved in those areas. And then you have G. Cosro who's focusing on church structures and the involvement of women in all levels of those structures. So you go from that first wave um, and then there's always work being done. So I don't want you to think there's nothing being done in between those two waves, because just like Dr. Clark pointed out, there's lots of women who are moving and shaking. And if you have any stories, by the way, on the sidebar, if you ever have any great stories of some of these women who their stories need to be told or shared more, please reach out and find me and, um, and let me know because I would love to amplify some of those stories. Um, so by the time we get to the 1970s, I know Pam said, you know, we were talking a little bit about the ERA piece. Um, by the time you get to the 1970s, church women, especially in the United Methodist Church, are feeling much stronger. They feel like they're earned their voices. They're, they're very strong using their voice. They're focusing on consciousness raising. 
they're looking at these women, these women's issues through the connection with this foundational theology of women's liberation. And they're trying to work on this full participation of women within the confines of the denomination. So the ERA really gives them a chance to use the structures they've already implemented in the Methodist church and take them outside the church. Because United Methodist Women, the women's division, have been working on these issues since the 1940s. They've been focusing on equal pay for equal women, on making sure that women have just as much opportunity, of trying to make sure there are safe working environments. The 1972 General Conference comes out and collectively endorses the ERA. They follow suit in 1976 and 1980. So the ERA is just this public announcement of the same thing that the Methodist Church has been fighting for for a lot of its existence in the 20th century. What slows it down, a lot of the anti-ERA efforts, which you probably know about, uh, which usually came on the heels of people like Phyllis Schlafly, who although she would not call herself a feminist, her actions very much define her as a feminist, although they may not line in with the values of feminism. Um, but the United Methodist Church comes out with a lot of the uh, documents to basically counter this misinformation that they see coming from the anti-ERA efforts. The Methodist Church is, is printing these pamphlets. They are using scripture to affirm uh, their position and to counter what the anti-ERA groups are using as scripture to support their part. The women's division is, is countering misinformation, even to the extent that in the states where ERA passage is not happening or it's very slow, they're telling families not to take vacation. And instead of taking vacation, we want you to stay and go lobby your, your state legislatures and make sure that you pass this bill. So they really believe that it's so important that you should not take your Sabbath and you should instead fight and advocate for this because it's such an important piece of legislation. The women's division becomes the only religious member to be a part of the board of ERA America. So this is a huge piece of the Methodist church being able to share what it's already doing, what it has been doing, and to kind of model for the rest of the world how we can do this better. Now, I will also sidebar that to say, we still had not perfected it. We still have not perfected it. And we probably will not perfect it because we are all beings of sanctification. Yes, I was about <laughs> I to do say believe- that. <laughs> That is a moment of sanctification when we actually can get to full participation. Um, eventually, between the anti-ERA and the Vietnam War, the ERA becomes a back burner discussion, unfortunately, and everybody has to focus on these other pieces. But I will say, even though those efforts outside the church may have slowed down, Inside the church, we continue to work on these issues. We continue to work on egalitarianism. We tried to make sure that gender was a protected status starting in 1988. And then when the ERA didn't proceed, you know, we know the work of Methodist women in the public sphere continues. Every one of you can name probably two or three, maybe five handfuls of Methodist women who are in these public spheres, who are doing this kind of work. People like Hillary Clinton, people like Winnie Mandela, people like Stacey Abrams. I could go on and on and on and on. Um, but all of you know them too. You've named them in the chat probably for people who have been doing this work and have implemented or have impacted what you're doing. Um, and so I think it has been really neat to just kind of follow this stream of like the United Methodist Church and the women within it in the public sphere and how they're doing this kind of work. Um, and how we're modeling for the rest of, of society what that can look like when we really push this to its extremes. And that's one of the things that we're really focusing on celebrating this year with the 50th anniversary. It's something that we hope continues, um, that our work of GCASRO is definitely not done. If you've been to previous Lunch and Learns, you've heard <laughs> that all of our data and our stats do not match up to what we would call full participation. Um, the right. women in, in in our churches have always been the majority of members, always. So how do we switch that, making sure that women 
have the fair share of leadership that's represented in the pews. Um, I'm not talking about women's domination, but I'm just talking about having the same space at the table uh, that everybody else has. So, yeah. so yeah, I'm, I would love to hear your thoughts and your um, questions that may bubble up from this. Yes. Anybody have any questions, any comments you'd like to make? Um, have you read any of the blogs and um, read something that kind of caught your attention and you want to think about that or share a comment with Emily today? We'd be happy to hear that as well. And if you haven't read our blogs, I'm going to put in the um, chat box a link to our webpage where you can get them real quick. Um, the first one came out uh, in January 31st, and actually our 50th year advocating for women's rights. And we are imagining 50 more years on the journey. That is our, our theme for this year. And our, I guess I should say the image that we are really looking at is the angel oak tree. I should show a picture of it. But we, and we learned how in our board meeting, how the roots are twice as deep as the branches above the ground. And so when you look at this huge angel oak tree down in um, South Carolina, um, or North Carolina, I apologize. It's um, huge. I mean, really, really huge, but it's really, can imagine the roots being as deep into the earth. And so um, that's who we are as an agency. What you see is just a fraction of who we are and what goes on beneath the surface. It's like Reverend Emily, who nourish us and inform us and advise us and all these things like we're learning today that help us stay and strengthened along this journey. So I'd like for you to talk a little bit about some of the lay folks again. I know you touched on it a little bit with Dr. Clark's comment, but um, I think it's also important for people to know that there's room for everybody. So when you talk about the lay women who have been very effective in moving the church forward, because when you think about the inception of our agency, everyone pushing to the legislation forward was not a clergy person. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I one of the things I loved reading about, somebody mentioned Teresa Hoover in the chat too. <laughs> Teresa Hoover was quite a spitfire. Um, she and uh, Thelma Stevens um, and Barbara Ricks Thompson like, really uh, pushed hard um, from the work that came out of the Women's Caucus. And they are looking at building this legislation and putting forward this commission um, that really is going to going to make the, make the church accountable for its actions. Um, and they do this work out of the foundation of the women's division. So the women's division is this lay organization still is um, focused on empowering lay people. And in turn, they also empower the clergy people, right? Like <laughs> we yes. learn a lot <laughs> from United Methodist Women, now United Women in Faith. Um, yes. So this, this organization I'm talking about, you could write volumes on the work that lay women have done, especially in the 20th century, between that social gospel era, building settlement houses. Bell Harris Bennett, who comes to the South and builds the Deaconess movement in the South, you end up um, going into the 40s and 50s, and the women's division is lobbying Congress for equal pay for women. They're they're looking at these issues of families and childcare, and they're constantly giving women instant giving women information to then go and advocate for themselves and for others to all of their legislators. So you're talking about this organization effort that comes from what I may consider the queen bee, lay woman, Frances Willard, who did want to be, she really wanted to be ordained, but she never was, she never got the opportunity. Um, but Frances Willard really gives the best model of how to organize, how to get the word out, how to preach and talk about these issues and how to agitate, how to educate, how to organize. She brings all of those facets to the church and just lays the groundwork out. And we have modeled that ever since. Um, and there are tons of lay women that will, we will never know that have been doing this kind of work um, and have been empowered by those models of organization and are gonna continue to empower others as well. So, I mean, as a clergywoman, there are things that I could never have done without lay women. I was a lay woman before uh, I was a clergy woman. And so the impact, if the church did not have lay women, the church would not exist. 
so um, I don't true. like to make huge generalizations as, as a historian, but for me, that's an absolute. Um, and it has yeah. been in all of American history, which I study, um, that if, if the women aren't there, there is no point in calling it a church. Wow, I tell you, uh, who was that that said they shared a birthday? Kelly Price, Dr. Kelly. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so cool. Mrs. Willard, yeah, she shares a birthday with her. And now Chris is saying he needs a whole course with this now. <laughs> I think we all- We need a whole course on Methodist women in seminary. I mean, yes. it, it is, listen, this is not, this is an amazing book. This is Grace Sufficient written by Jean Miller Schmidt. It is the book on Methodist women up to 1939, but it stops there. So like, we need a lot more information. Hopefully I'll write a book one day. We'll see how we got, you I will. gotta finish my dissertation first. <laughs> <laughs> but we definitely need to know more about these Methodist women, because I think I in terms of how we move forward as Methodists, we have to figure out how to empower these younger generations of how to let them stand on our shoulders and then how they let people stand on their shoulders. And just, I mean, I look at it as the communion of saints, right? Mm -hmm. Women have their own communion of saints. We have had people who have come before. We are here now and we are gonna continue to go. And, and it's gonna be this beautiful communion where one day we're all gonna be sitting with Georgia Harkness and Francis Willard <laughs> and with uh, In that Clara great McClain. crowd of witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> and with Dr. Irma Clark yes. and me and, and Kelly and Lori and Chris, we're all going to be sitting there just remembering what a powerful witness we had because someone was a powerful witness to us. And I think that's the I huge narrative raising, of Methodism. Mm -hmm. And I think you're raising a really good point because now um, many people are saying we're using, we're losing our young people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Many churches are seeing, especially because of the pandemic, when we had to shut our door, that some of their young people are not back yet. Um, how do you engage a younger demographic around these historical concepts that could help aid them in understanding their worth and their value, not just women, but everybody in the church, in particular for our young women? You know, I, at Boston University, I get to be a teaching fellow, which is an incredible opportunity. And I talk with young women all the time who never knew about some of these women that we talk about. You know, when we're talking about Frances Willard, they're asking, who is this? Like, they've never been told. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can't, I, I, you know, Pam, we said this earlier before a lot of people got on. If you can't see yourself in those roles, like, why are you going to participate in that? And I think... It comes in sharing those stories. It comes in talking about why they're so inspirational for us. And it comes in that web of relationships. You know, we are really good at relationships. That's, um, in fact, the other day I was hearing about um, Madeline Albright talking about like, that's why we're so good at the work we that women do is because we are socially based. We work well in relationships and we know how to keep them strong. And I think that's our job now is to build those relationships with the younger women is to build relationships so that they know how to build relationships and we continue that path um i think we've gotten a little too caught up in whether we agree or not on some things and instead we need to focus on the fact that we just all need to continue to be support for each other whether or not we agree on every single issue mm -hmm. so yes chris grace sufficient gene miller schmidt yeah, I just put a link to it through Amazon in the chat for anyone who's interested in purchasing that. That looks like a good book. I think I've seen it before in this library. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thought to uh, connecting with the sororities? I find that in my church, there seems to be more value to being an AK or a Delta than to being part of United Women in Faith. How can we make that connection? You know, I think we have to work on creating relevancy again, as far as the church, you know, we used to be a third place. Um, I'm getting into my preacher mode here. Um, we were used to being a third place for so long, um, home, school, homework, and then the church, um, that the church right now, when we argue and scuffle about all these issues and we make ourselves look so terrible out in the public sphere, um, we we negate the 
message of grace. We negate the message of social holiness. John Wesley said, there is no holiness, but social holiness. And for me, that's a huge piece of Methodism that younger people can definitely hold on to and go, oh, I get this. Like, I love Jesus and that comes out because I help my friend or I help this person on the street or I help build this or I help eradicate this kind of policy that's doing a lot of, of damaging work. So I think the way that we do that is we bring social holiness back up to the forefront. When we're talking about grace, that social holiness becomes a whole lot more prominent and stop arguing like... <laughs> I said, I said this that that has a lot of context right now in the in the United Methodist Church, um, but even in Christianity and beyond, um, I think we all realize that we don't have that third place anymore. Now we're a fifth, sixth, maybe even tenth place um, because the larger issues of politics um, and our theology have become such gridlock. Um, and so, as far as the Methodist Church. I think we stand on that that um, doctrine of social holiness. I think we really start to put emphasis on how we are trying to transform the world by doing the work that we're doing. And the I young people are there, be, they will come. <laughs> and I think we need to be mindful that it's about relationship. When you think in terms of some of these external organizations, fraternities, sororities, and other clubs. They're all about building connection and relationship and people want to be a part of something. And so why not be a part of what we're doing in the church, you know? And so we've got to continue to focus on relationship building. That's one of the reasons why I like the discipleship, see all the people, because it was really about not just going out trying to make disciples, but build relationship with people. And when people feel like they're seen and they're heard, they feel connected to the greater mission of whatever it is you're trying to do. So I just want to put that plug in there for us to, to focus on relationship building. And, and um, it's more than just inviting someone to come to an event. It's about, do you know me? Do you see me? And am I relevant in your world or in your group? And if so, then I feel comfortable coming and being a part of it. I'm going to chat real quick because I see some comments. Oh, I want to take what Chris is talking about because yeah. he's exactly right. We have to stop telling young people, wait your turn. They are the leaders of the now. We need mm -hmm. to resource them and empower them and give mm -hmm. them the tools that they need. Your young people can write legislation to general conference. They can write legislation to your annual conference. They can make a huge dent if they're given the tools and resources and they just need somebody to help show them the ropes, help teach them how to get around Robert's rules of order, since that is our main way of, of doing business. If they're taught that, if they're given those tools, I've watched this happen in North Alabama. We give our young people these tools, they run with it. They're writing legislation to our annual conference. They're engaged in general conference polity. They know what's going on. They know mm -hmm. how to do these things. But Pam, it's the relationship piece. It's mm -hmm. not just saying, I'm gonna bring you along. So in 30 years, you get to do this. It's like, I'm going to bring you along and in 30 minutes, I'm going to throw you in. I'm going to give you everything you need. Absolutely. And I'm going to be right here with you. That's right. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. I do see Dr. Martha Banks has her hand raised. Go ahead. Um, yes. One of the things that I think about uh, is our marketing. Uh, United Methodists don't tend to have um a, a good church image. Um, a friend of mine from another denomination asked me, um, do Methodists do any kind of mission? Oh my goodness. I, yes, exactly, oh. exactly. Lots and mission. lots of it. <laughs> how, how did that, how did she get the idea that we don't do mission? Um, and, I, and so we need to do, we need to proactively put ourselves out there. And I, I believe in a lot of ways, it has to be the faces of women that are out there in front demonstrating what our missions are and what we, are, what we have accomplished today and what we are doing now. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I totally agree. Oh, you should have shared with her that United Methodist women are in mission around the world, everywhere. We mm -hmm. have 92 
areas that we support. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's I, true. I, I did. I was the dean of Mission yes. U at the and time. We, and we are in mission around the world. Do you know that UNCOR is now in the UK right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have been there for a couple of weeks. Okay. Yes, that's right. So we are in mission. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> Come on, Dr. Clark, maybe we want to get you started. Yes. <laughs> I think a comment was made too about the digital world and how, um, you know, we're, we've got to connect more in terms of our young people in wow. the places in which they dwell. And I think that's a great comment um, that we do need to, to be more willing to get out there in the, in the digital world. And I am not the best when it comes to technology. I have ruined quite a few laptops and other computers in my day. Um, but there are people who can help us, right? Yes, and yes. Uh, so I think that we have to find ways in which to connect with young people. And even if that means doing some things virtually, because that's their world right now. Um, and sharing these kinds of messages around our history and why it's important to take us from where we are to where we want to go over the next 40, 50 years of our journey together, especially as an agency, uh, is very vital to being able to do that. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, the question Chris is raising is, um, many lady will ask, what can I do? How can I get involved? Um, do you want to answer that, Reverend Emily? Yeah, I, I responded to Chris in the chat. And when um, I worked in the conference office, I would have people call and say, I just want to know how to get how to do this. And I would say, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, well, I want to teach kids how to read. OK, here's a resource. They teach kids how to read every Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock in your area. Call them, tell them you want to help. It's usually for us in the church, I think, of connecting those re those resources. For me, that's that's the deacon's work. I love the work of the deacon yes. of bridging the church to the world. So I'm passionate about those kind of things. And if I don't know the answer right away, it is go find that answer and get back to that person. <laughs> um, and so it is, you know, I think a lot of our people, there's that question comes more from an overwhelming sense of there's so much wrong in the world. I don't know where to start. So I think it's helping them to go back. It's like, what are you good at? What do, yeah. what are you most passionate about? Let's get started there. And then you can go from there. And if you want to expand that, and they typically do, they typically get involved in something bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and their life is fulfilled because they've, they've reached that point of vocational call and passion that we talk about, um, that the sweet spot um, of really getting people uh, connected to their calling in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments or, or questions that anyone would like to, to ask? Um, and while you're thinking of a question or comment, I wanted to know, and Emily is also wanting to know, does anyone here have any suggestions on any further readings that you want to share with this group around the women in the church and our history? Um, any particular bio biography that you've read that you thought was very powerful that may have been transformative for you? Anybody, please feel free to share. You can either put it in the chat or you can just say it out loud so we can take some notes. We'd like to know any resources you have. If you put those in the chat, then I'm going to show you some of my favorites too, because um, <laughs> I have some real great ones that I always love to share. Um, we hope so. so. I'll pop them up and throw them in. So this is one of my favorite newest books about American Methodist and women's rights. It's called Nevertheless, and it's written by Dr. Ashley Boggendruff. She is the General Secretary of General Commission on Archives and History. Um, this is her second book. Um, her first one is called Entangled, and it is really good, too. Um, but this is one of my favorites. I'm talking about women in Methodism. Um, Who's it by again? Who is that one by? Dr. Ash Ashley Boggendruff. D-R-E-F-F. Okay. okay. Um, Alice Knotts, uh, who Emily mentions in her book, uh, put together this anthology called Fellowship of Love, and it's a Methodist women changing American racial attitudes uh, in the late 20th century. So this is a great book put out by Kingswood Books, Fellowship of Love by Alice Knotts, K-N-O-T-T-S. Um, and then another favorite of mine that goes way back to 1981, 
um, the Archives and History and the Women's History Committee put together this conference in 1981 about prominent women in history and different um, pieces. And it's a two volume. It's called Women in New Worlds. Kind of hard to find sometimes, but your library at your church might have it or the conference office might have it. Um, but it's put together by Rosemary Skinner Keller and Hyla Thomas are the editors. Um, there is my favorite, I love, there's an incredible article in here about Mary McLeod Bethune, um, which I really loved reading. Um, it talks a lot about women's roles uh, through the church. It talks a lot about the deaconess movement. Um, Can you see and then it again? My, Can I see oh, it again? Yeah. You're going so fast. I can't get them fast enough. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Mary Skinner. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, I'm going to push one that G. Cosro helped put out, and it's the uh, Women and Bishops book. So this is an incredible book in partnership with Judith Craig's first book um, yes. called The Leading Women. So um, definitely, these are some great reads uh, that you can check out. So, yeah. Do you have the book in the middle of tomorrow? I don't. Do I need to get it? <laughs> I doubt if you can find it now. You probably can. But that is one that was written by, I'm trying to think of her name. And it's all about United Methodist women, the beginning and everything that you, everything that you wanted to know. You would become a United Methodist woman right then and there after you finish reading it. No. Um, oh, what is her name? Um, uh, in the middle of tomorrow. I'm forever letting people use that book because they always want to uh, get good excerpts from it. So it's great. I can't think of her name at, right now, but I'll let Reverend Pam know and she can give it to you later, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Well, she'll okay. be sure to share that. Mm -hmm. All right, any more resources anyone wanna share before we get going? If you have anything extra you, you like to think about or you come to mind later, by all means, okay, I'm seeing them popping up into the chat box. By all means, send them to me in an email and we'll make sure that Reverend Emily gets that, but we'll also be able to post that in some of our material to make sure that others also have it as well, because we certainly appreciate you sharing your wisdom and knowledge and information you have. Mothers of Israel, Methodist Beginnings Through the Eyes of Women. Huh, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the North Carolina Conference just put out a blog post that G. Cosro shared on their Facebook page of great books as well. So mm -hmm. some of these are mentioned down there and there's a few others that I actually went to Amazon to find used copies of before this call. So I got them ordered. Yes, yes, they did a great job as well. Mm -hmm. So we are so grateful for all of you who have tuned in on today. We've had a fantastic lesson and a information <laughs> that provided us with some background and some foundational information. Um, Oh, thank you, Chris, for that. Better World Books is a great place to get used books. Um, Dr. Banks is saying spirituality and social responsibility, a vocational vision of women in, in the Methodist tradition. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we will certainly add these to our list of materials and resources. Oh, you just ordered that one. <laughs> I just ordered it this morning. It was on the North Carolina list. And I was like, oh, I need oh. that one because Rosemary... Rosemary Skinner Keller wrote it, so I, that's a good one. <laughs> that one's the one, um, spiritual and social responsibility. Yeah, 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 that's awesome, awesome. I don't have it, but I will after today. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone for being with us and we are so happy for you. Um, you will be receiving in an email after today a survey. We'd love to get your feedback to let us know if you enjoyed today's session, if you have any ideas for some additional topics. We're always open to study and learn more about things that matter to you. So please, please share that information with us. In fact, before you log off, pop a, a comment or so in the chat box to let us know if there's something that you'd like to know more about, uh, whether it be how do we write legislation, as, as Reverend Emily was mentioning, how do we you know, move our young people forward, whatever it might be, we can have a lunch and learn session where you can learn more about doing that. So I'm going to let you, Reverend Emily, have the last word of departure before we go. Thank you, Sandra, for your comment. Appreciate that. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. 
All right. Well, I like I said in the chat, I'm really grateful for all of your um, book suggestions, for all naming all of the amazing women that have impacted your life. Um, and for all of you being here today, sharing in this community of saints and this communion of saints. Um, and I hope that you take from this um, some empowerment and some uplift uh, from the amazing Methodist women that have we have stood on their shoulders, but I also invite you to dig your heels in and get ready for someone to climb on your shoulders because yours is next. Yes. Thank y'all. Thanks everybody. We will see Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much.